Hey folks, today let's go back in time, when I was perhaps still 9 in the year 1999, on the evening my first PC arrived at home. It was thanks to my older sister, who needed a PC for CAD software which she was learning to use at school, that my father bought from the local store that original PC, which I remember mounted a Pentium 2, 4GB of drive and 56MB of RAM, and I never knew what was the graphic card. So, the technician named Napoleone mounted everything, and for the first time I saw Windows 98 being booted, and this was kinda the desktop. There were also Microsoft Word 2000, Excel, PowerPoint, and there was this curious icon, and after a while I was finally showed what it was. You must know that this good man used to install on every PC mounted and sold the shareware version of DOOM. Back then, the games I played were a bit the arcades, or the Super Mario series and other Nintendo games, which were partly ripped and included in those Famicom consoles sold for cheap. Besides, I also became one of the very few children at school owning a personal computer at home. They were quite expensive and usually used only in working places. Doom was like anything I would ever imagined a video game could be. And I'm talking about the level of violence, the speed, the labyrinthine levels, the banging soundtrack and the horror. This video is not just a review. One man does not simply review Doom in 2023 and dares to consider it worth of a try. Because Doom is fucking history, is the FPS equivalent of Super Mario Bros. and has been ported on every imaginable platform. By the way, I will not rob you of your time trying to lecture on the history of the development and impact on the industry of Doom, because more qualified people than me already have done that, and like you all, I saw many videos and read articles during uh, all these years. I also both and read these holy scriptures. And uh, yes, I still haven't read John Romero's new book, but I will soon. This video is quite personal. It's the story of how I ended up knee deep in the gaming. At that age, our initial attempts of playing Doom were like a challenge. First, just because it was in English. And English was kinda an alien language, and we knew just few words and expressions, so I didn't know I was selecting here and included a full episode, or that is actually a difficulty level. And my first approach with the movement controls was uh, like this, with my then little hands. I didn't know I could run using the shift button or the strafe movements. Also, with my sister I spent a lot of time just watching the demos, wondering how we'll ever reach those levels, or why there's another guy fighting monsters in this part. Is he a friend or an enemy? We never encountered him and it was a mystery. Watching for the first time enemies being killed brutally or reduced in jibs was fucking amazing, and their verses remained imprinted in the mind forever, because Doom is indeed a magnificent sound compartment curated by the legendary Bobby Prince, that composed one of the most distinguishable soundtracks in all gaming, commissioned by that mad lad of John Romero that gave him the good material from which to take inspiration. Now I will show some examples of Doom's monsters growling sounds when they are nearby. These are the zombie men. Then the hymns. And these are the goddamn pinkies. This damn demon always gave me chills. It's really one of the most iconic monsters I've ever seen. As you can see, Doom is composed by 3 episodes, containing 9 levels each, and in 1995 with the release of the commercial version named The Ultimate Doom, it featured the fourth called Die Flesh Consumed. 
Ok, let's start. A wise man I used to follow once said, Gentlemen, play Doom at ultra violence. And believe me, below that the game is kinda easy. Also because ultra violence better encourages crowd control. That is, prioritizing the elimination of some enemies over others. And it must be said that the monsters are very well balanced with attacks that are easy to telegraph. By the way, if you're a masochist, there's always nightmare mode, where the enemies don't telegraph shit, they are much much faster, do more damage and resurrect after a short time. Sure, the ammo pickups are doubled, but damn, you have to speedrun without worrying about killing everything. After all, this difficulty was a joke towards those who complained that the game was too simple. And yes, I think it's a good joke indeed. The first legendary episode, Knee Deep in the Dead, included in the demo which I replayed far too many times, is still an impressive achievement, because it's a masterwork of level design, where John Romero experimented with what he called abstract geometry, creating complex levels that didn't necessarily resemble real places. And what I also like is the balanced difficulty curve. It's never unfair, the monster closets are placed rightly, and the secrets leading to useful health bonuses and hardly strong weapons are a joy to find. Just to name one, in the second level there's this hidden room that permits to open a secret door that leads outside to the freaking chain gun. I was so happy to discover it. And the levels get better and better, with more labyrinth in the level design, but still intuitive to navigate, until the end at Phobos Anomaly, where the two barons of hell make this historical entrance and function as the episode's final boss. <laughs> the first time, challenging the Bruiser brothers was terrible. We didn't know about the running button or strafing, so they used to kill us easily, and the easiest way to succeed was to arrive here with many spare rockets. And after they're killed, the walls start to descend and finally it's time for the ending. And this ending was uh, mind-blowing. The protagonist gets teleported in this dark room full of monsters, and is soon, let's say, killed, and this wall of text appears. See, Doom doesn't feature cutscenes or classic narration, the informations of a central plot are reported just in the manual, and then there are these texts at the end of episodes, followed by an eventual artwork. The original game director Tom Hall, which was forced to leave the company during the development of Doom, even wrote a Doom Bible that was rejected by John Kermack, who preferred the immediacy of gameplay, stating Story in a game is like a story in a porn movie. It's expected to be there, but it's not that important. Well, it's his opinion. Returning to the past, we tried hard to translate everything, but some words like uh, badasses were kinda impossible with a simple dictionary, and well, we didn't understand shit of what happened and just made some theories. After some years, I finally had the chance to play the full version, and I was happy as fuck. The second episode, called The Shores of Hell, is quite different from the previous one, and starts to feature environments resembling military bases conceived by Tom Hall, which weren't much appreciated by the rest of the team. And due to his departure, most of these levels were completed by the new arrived Sandy Peterson. This chapter is indeed more difficult, there are more monsters from the start, and higher tiers appear immediately. In fact, we'll soon get to know the new demons, the Kako demons and the Lost Souls, but what I wasn't expecting is that Barons of Hell would become common enemies. Those are really terrible fuckers, and in the second level I also started to run short of ammo, and had to rely on the Berserk upgrade that makes Fist super powerful for the entire level's duration, and the Chainsaw that is very useful against single Kako demons and pinkies in narrow places, but it's totally useless against a Baron of Hell, because this asshole doesn't stagger at all. There's also this new weapon called the Plasma Gun, which has this curious cooldown animation after being shot. 
I consider it a sort of attempt to make it more balanced, or else it would fire without ever stopping like the chain gun, though its ammo are not that common and must be spared for the spongiest monsters. I'll tell you frankly, I don't dislike or bash these new levels. I think Peterson has actually done a good work, and yes, sometimes they feel less inspired or intuitive to navigate, but still there are some nice moments, like the ending of the sixth map, also the damned. There's this fake exit that feels quite sadistic, and surprise me, I really like it. The last level named the Tower of Babel has this peculiarity that is built in the Ender Mission screens, as we progress through the levels preceding it. At the entrance we can see hanged corpses of Barons of Hell, as a sign that the Lord here is perhaps very powerful, but also pissed. In fact, the iconic cyber demon doesn't fuck around. It fires bars of free missiles that hurt like hell, and at ultra violence it's accompanied by lost souls. It's a nice battle, and once defeated we're showed this message followed by this artwork. Basically, the base we were fighting in has been teleported above hell itself, and now it's time to descend and fight them in their own territory. Yes, in hell. The third episode, Inferno, has an even more brutal start, because the ammo is quite scarce and the second level almost drove me crazy. Zluo Despair is full of hidden demons in niches, which killed me quite easily. Maybe I'm getting old, I don't know, but I really suffered this level, though I like it that it has the shape of a hand, it's rather peculiar. The whole episode contains some interesting levels like Pandemonium and Limbo, though the latter gave me troubles with the many teleports, and I got lost in the final section wasting a lot of time. Instead, I never liked much Hanoli Cathedral and the secret level, which partly recycles the first and has a freaking cyber demon as a common enemy. Seriously, holy shit. And see this? The BFG 9000 is the most powerful weapon of the game and is quite hidden. This big fucking gun fires an energy blast that causes enormous damage to single opponents, and it also propagates to other enemies on screen according to calculations I don't really get. And due to the fact it consumes 40 energy cells in common with the plasma gun, it's better to use it only against barons of hell and bosses, but sometimes it came handy to clean large packs of low tiers which got on my nerves. The final level of Inverno, I think we'll all agree that is nothing great, not only because the arena is quite basic like the Tower of Babel, but above all because the Spider Mastermind is underwhelming and goes down pretty fast using the BFG. But even without that, we can exploit the other demons and cause him fighting. There are enough rockets and plasma cells to kill it without much effort. And as the spider demon collapses reduced in jibs, we can finally see the ending of Doom. Well, that's quite the plot twist. The demons seem to have taken Earth, and will fight them in Doom 2. And this was everything. No, wait, it's time for the fourth episode. Die Flesh Consumed, it's much more difficult than all the previous episodes, and counts on the participation of the young American McGee, who designed the first insane level, where ammunitions are scarce and the enemies are numerous and is succeeded by the infamous perfect hatred by John Romero. Right at the start we get assaulted by many cacodemons, the ammo is limited and the pits full of lava are not encouraging. 
Also, there are sections full of barons of hell, and a cyber demon guards the exit room, which is full of other cacodemons. Surviving this map is like a graduation. Also, platforming in Doom is not engaging. You know, the game doesn't fit proper jumps and tries to simulate it by running from the edges of platforms to the ones next. Well, finishing Perfect Hatred is very satisfying, and the rest of the episode is not bad at all. The sixth map, named Against the Weekly, is designed again by Romero and features the damn platforming again and another cyber demon near the exit. And it's not even the last one to face in this chapter. The final level by Sean Green is actually nice and features a final battle against a spider mastermind. It's always less engaging than a cyber demon, but still I like its design. And now Doom is really finished. And this final message followed by this artwork, well, it contains a plot element which was surprisingly resumed in Doom Eternal. That was a nice homage indeed. And to conclude, Doom is not just a game, it's a cultural icon and a testament of how video games used to be great with a lot of passion, creativity and exploitation of technical limitations. And it also counts on the greatest community in all gaming, which offers yearly map packs and total conversions, and I dare you to deny this statement. My starting point as a player couldn't be better. That technician who installed the shareware version everywhere was a real saint. And after Doom, my other important first games were Need for Speed 3 Hot Pursuit, MDK, Quake and the sequel Doom 2. Then came the wait for Doom 3, which I'll cover during the next year. Replaying Doom for this video has been a wonderful throwback. Uh, the last time was many years ago, but still I had a vivid memory of many iconic levels, and listening again to some legendary music tracks, the shotgun's firing sound and the monster's growls is one of the greatest pleasures. As always, a warm thanks to all viewers, hope to see you in the next entry, and happy new year to come!